Hey guys, how's it going? In today's video, I want to cover uh, small ways that you can improve your code, make it easier to reason about and easier to read. So um, to start with a general advice, I would say that the most fundamental thing you can do is you can read your code before you open a pull request and uh, make sure that it's readable for you know, the people that are going to have to maintain it. Take that extra couple of minutes to just go through the code and read the verbs. Did I, does this function name accurately represent what it does in the body of the function? Or is this variable name clear enough? Like just think about the reader of your code more than um, you, right? So. I think it's a more junior developer is very concerned with does my code work, right? Whereas as you progress to a senior role, that's not your only concern. You're very concerned about is this code simple? Is it easy to read? Will someone struggle to understand what I meant here? Um, so a more senior developer is not only concerned with does my code work? Although of course that's a concern, but does it work elegantly? Is it simple? And um, so yeah, uh, that's something you definitely wanna do. All right guys, let's jump in. So the first thing I have for you is indentation. Try to keep your functions, uh, try to keep the happy path without indentation. So your expected scenario, your most common use case, the happy path, is it kind of like in your trunk. And then any edge cases, any unhappy scenarios, you indent them to the side, right? So. Uh, why? Because uh, hopefully a developer will be able to read from top to bottom your function and they will find sort of like the happy path. And if they want to see edge cases or maybe weird scenarios, things that can happen that are not expected, they go to the sides. You do this to avoid having the developer kind of zigzag around, you know, like, oh, here's a happy path and it goes that way, then it comes back, then it goes that way. Or maybe your happy path is buried all the way to the right. So like there's an if, and then there's an other if, and then if these things happen and all the way over here, that's your happy scenario. That's the return successful. And that's kind of hard to read. So whenever you can try to indent away the non-happy uh, situations. To give an example, I have a very stupid, silly little function, find by ID here. So, uh, you know, what this does is if I receive an ID, well, then I fetch the user and then I return that user. This would be my happy path inside this if, right? So first of all, you'll notice that this else is not necessary because this returns here. So if I'm here, it means that it hasn't returned. Now, the, the next thing that I would do is I would say, um, if I don't receive an ID, then I, uh, then I return null and I do this down here, right? So I exit quickly when I don't receive an ID and then I, without indentation here, that's my happy path. Um, this is, a, I know it's a small example, right? But what you would do is you check your parameters, your arguments in your function. If there's something wrong, you exit quickly. And then you would kind of like try to indent all the unhappy scenarios, maybe call a different function or something else. And you would keep the trunk here free for your happy path. Might not always be possible, but whenever it is, it's a very, it makes it a lot easier to reason about. You'll see also that as you do this, you'll use less and less the keyword else. Right? You're just not gonna have else branches because you're usually exiting or you're returning something else. Simple thing, right? All right. The next thing is to name your constants. So um, in this case, for instance, uh, in the add address function, uh, if a user has uh, more than four addresses, you, know, you can't add any more, you throw an error. Notice that in this case, it's kind of obvious, right? If you it's obvious that this four is the max number of addresses. It might not always be obvious, right? In fact, I've given an example just now, but you could say, you know, max addresses for user or something like that. Uh, I don't know, like maybe in this case it's not necess necessary, but I had to work for instance for a company in which it was a shipping company. So when it, when it was the warehouse, they would do 
the, the main headquarters warehouse, they would do a specific logic. And when it was an offshore or satellite warehouse, they would do something else. And this warehouse had you know, auto-generated IDs, but they also had like a business number, a business name for the warehouse. So in the middle of the code, the, the, there was an if branch that said, if warehouse dot uh, business number or something like that equals you know, five, then do this, uh, else do this. And I'm like, what does it mean? Well, why five? What? And if they had said, for instance, if warehouse, you know, business number equals main headquarters, do this, else, you know, do that. Uh, that would have been easier for me to reason about because um, I would be like, oh, okay, they're doing something for the warehouse, for the main one, and they're doing something else for the offshore sort of satellite warehouses. And that would have made it would have made it easier for me to understand. Uh, obviously, sometimes it's not necessary to do this. Maybe if you have a, a liquor store and you have and you're trying to sell alcohol to someone, and your code says, you know, if customer dot age greater than twenty one, you know, sell. Um, and that you know, twenty one is fairly obvious. Maybe you don't need to put a name on it. Also, use enums. If it's like a status or something that, uh, something like a user status or order status or kinds of things, you know, maybe you can put them in an enum. With this point, I refer mostly to just numbers that maybe do not fit in an enum, right? That are just a single number or something like that. So the next thing is function names, clear verbs. See, if we go to line 13, you have this check user function. What does check user do in the create user method? Well, um, does it check that the user exists in the database? Maybe if the email is taken, does it check if the user is a valid user? Well, if we go to the definition, we see that it's checking that the user is valid, right? I wouldn't do validation this way. I'm just illustrating here. So, mm, you know, like maybe do not call it uh, uh, check, you know, maybe you could be like, oh, well, let's rename this to uh, validate user. Uh, and then you know that is what kind of check you're doing, you're validating the user. If you like to, if you're throwing a lot, like you can see back where we were in the create user, that I'm not assigning this to any, anything, right? So this is probably throwing, I would assume that this is throwing. So maybe it's better if, if, you, if your function is very likely to throw, which I, I don't know if that's a great thing. I probably would discourage that. But let's say that you know, you're going to throw if you, your function is going to check for something. And if it's not correct, it's going to throw. Sometimes I like for the word throw to be in there. Throw if user invalid, for instance. Because the person consuming this, looking at this code right here, they're going to know that their function, that this is going to throw. And if they're here, it's because the user is valid. They're going to know from the signature of the function. In reality, what I would probably do is something like validate user. And then I would store this in, maybe this would be like validation errors. And this would be an array of errors. And then I would check for that, right? But just giving you an example of something that that you could do. Okay, the next thing on my list is avoid doing unexpected things inside your function. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you'll have a, a validation function or something that, uh, uh, this has happened to me so many times where a developer wrote code that they are, in which they're doing a bunch of things that are very reasonable from the name of the function. But out of nowhere, in the fifth line or somewhere in there, they do something else. Maybe they assign something to an object or any, I had no clue that they would be doing that there, right? Because I, see, all the things that I'm telling you about here, the main purpose is for you to write functions in which if the person reads the name and the arguments, hopefully they don't have to read the body. Hopefully they know they kind of, oh, this is obvious, you know, I'm going to use this function. I don't have to. The worst thing you can do to a person is to force them 
to every time they want to use your function to go have to read the body of the function to make sure that it's doing what they would assume that it will do. That's the worst thing because you have no abstraction, right? You want to use this create user function here. And what do you expect create user to do? Do you expect create user to uh, create an address? Do you expect create user to update uh, locations or, or warehouses? No, you wanted to create a user. Okay, so my next item is minimize non-explicit behavior in classes contract. So maybe there's a right term for this. What I tend to refer to is explicit behavior and non-explicit behavior in a contract for a class. For instance, in the user service, you have the create user. That's very explicit. You pass in a user and it will create it. Very obvious. But sometimes you have implicit behavior. For instance, when the ordering of the functions matters, right? So imagine that for add address here, imagine that before you call this, you had to absolutely call update user. You had to call update user and then you call add address. And if you don't do that, it doesn't work. That's not true in this case, but just imagine, okay? So that's implicit. You, it's not clear from the, from the code that you have to follow that. And that's sort of like, I, I wrote an illustration here. We had something like this in, in, some of, in one of our projects where you had an email service that had a prepare email body that will receive the email ID and the email body. And then you had a send email function. Now, if you wanted to use this somewhere else in your code, you had to first call prepare email body, passing the stuff, and then the result of that, you would, pop, uh, you would pass to send email. This is not always it's a trivial example, but it's not always obvious where first you have to call this function that just gets you ready to call something else in the service and things like that. It's just, it's not implicit. If you can't avoid it, maybe leave a comment. You know, it's very important that you call this first or it's very important that this is called only in this context. If you can, please avoid that. Okay, my next advice is to prepare, uh, prefer Pure functions. Pure functions are functions that uh, if you give them a given input, they will always return the same output. Uh, they will not have side effects that mutate state uh, somewhere else. So these are the easiest functions to test because you always give them the same, they always return the same. It's not always possible, but you can sort of strive towards this. Whenever you can, keep your functions pure. The next thing on my list is avoid mutating parameters that you receive um, or unmonkey patching, right? So uh, sometimes a, a, a developer, if they're feeling particularly lazy that day, you know, maybe they receive something like here, prepared email, right? That they're gonna send. And then they mark this, you know, maybe is sent, uh, is sent as true and then they return the email and they mutated this. First of all, don't do that, okay? Second of all, this sort of, it's not expected for send email to mutate this argument. And furthermore, you, is that maybe is sent is not even an attribute of prepare email, maybe you're monkey patching. And it happened to me that maybe you have a large function that probably should be broken down and they receive an argument and they have to do a lot of things and sometimes they store the results of calculations in the objects that they receive and then they mutate stuff or they have a, maybe an, a user object and they call this function and this function will add something to that object and so on. It's just, it, become, it becomes very hard to know if you have an object that is being mutated by a whole bunch of different functions, who put this here? Who put that there? Like it's just, if you can avoid it, just please don't do that. And uh, all right guys, so I think we're running very long here. I'm gonna make a second video with a few more things that I, that I wanna add to this list. If you like the content, if you think that the advice is good, that this works for you, please do not forget to leave a like and a subscribe and I will see you in the next one.